pushing one. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm James Moran from Apprenticeship Support Australia. Uh, we support apprentices and trainees nationally. And uh, we're joined this afternoon by CM Mr. Farby to talk about um, workplace bullying, a, a topic that's very prevalent in today's workplace. Place, and um, I guess it's part of what we normally do in advising employers of um, employees and trainees and apprentices across the country and providing advice and information. Um, so welcome, uh, uh, Cena, this afternoon. Cena is a, a senior associate um, and accredited specialist with Australian business lawyers and advisors. Um, he comes to us this afternoon with more than 10 years experience in this space, so it's fantastic that he's joined us and has been able to spend some time um, around about the next half hour or so just talking about workplace bullying. Um, as you have questions that come along um, throughout the presentation this afternoon, if you could note them in the comment section on Facebook, we will try to um, actually get to those questions if we have time today, but if not, we'll definitely come back to you individually along the way to, um, to answer those questions. And if you've got something that sort of comes up that's more of a, a nature you want to share privately, then you should inbox us on that and we can come back to you with individual responses. So, um, don't forget that um, if you're um, looking for information on the documentation side of things, HR Advance is definitely there as an area for you to have a look at. And um, you know, let's we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that towards the end of the presentation. But welcome, Cena. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, well, I'm going to leave you to sort of introduce the topic for us and give us a bit of a snapshot of the um, the, the cases and what we're seeing um, happening in workplaces today, and some of the things that employers should be aware of to try and safeguard their organisations and make sure that they're the best employers that they can be. So um, thank you. Thanks, James. Uh, so we're going to look at a few, three cases, quite quite recent. Um, the, the least recent of which is from December last year, but um, one from this month, um, last month I should say, from February of this year, and another one from January of this year. Uh, it's a confronting area in terms of um, the nature of the cases and some of the details of what we'll be discussing today is, is, is quite confronting, but that's the nature of, of, of this area, unfortunately. Uh, but that doesn't mean that businesses should feel helpless in terms of uh, managing them. There are ways and means of managing these cases, but uh, the idea of today is we'll give some recent uh, run-through of things that have happened and uh, how where the employees went right, where they might have went wrong, what they might have done differently. Mm -hmm. So uh, the first case we're looking at uh, this afternoon is a case of M and Winslow Constructors. It's a Victorian case uh, from uh, 17th of December, that's 2015, uh, in the Victorian Supreme Court. Um, that case involved a female labourer uh, who was frequently abused, bullied, and unfortunately sexually harassed, uh, in, including a rape threat. Um, the employee was successful in suing her employer, uh, a Victorian construction company, uh, for negligence in failing to provide her with a safe working environment. During her employment, and these, these were the allegations heard and decided by the court, uh, the labourer endured taunts of uh, whether she had uh, silicon boobs and there were vile uh, sexually explicit remarks that were made in relation to her. Um, there were allegations that on one occasion she was grabbed by the hips and there was a, a simulated sex act performed on her. Uh, she was also receiving very inappropriate comments um, from colleagues, uh, not just of a sexual but also of a non-sexual nature, uh, and also unfortunately a threat of, of violence even expressed as a joke. Uh, she was reluctant, as is very common unfortunately in these cases, uh, to complain about the matters to her foreman, um, as he was also responsible for some of the offensive remarks and that's the matter heard by the court. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, on the last day of work she uh, was taunted um, with a threat that someone was going to follow her home uh, and then there was a, 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 a rape threat that was made against her at that point. At that point enough was enough. Uh, she reported this to the person um, she believed to be responsible for HR matters uh, and then unfortunately that person also um, used the opportunity to uh, make an unwelcome sexual advance. Uh, following that exchange she received an anonymous call um, from a male um, making a, another sexually charged comment to her. Uh, that was the end of her working life at that particular uh, company. Um, as a result of that incident, uh, or that series of incidents um, that happened over a long term, she suffered psychiatric uh, injuries, including uh, chronic PTSD, so post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, 
the employer in that case was found to be negligent uh, in allowing what was described as a toxic working environment and there was an award made uh, in the employee's favour for $1.36 million. So, yeah, that's a fairly um, appalling example of um, bullying as well as harassment uh, and some other things. Mm. So maybe, Sarah, if we spend a bit of time now just thinking about what the employer may have done differently in that situation, because obviously it's, it's quite disturbing to hear that that sort of thing would be going on in a workplace today. Um, if you were giving advice to an employer that was you know, facing a case like this, what are the key areas that they should have had a look at to um, make sure that there were safeguards against such terrible practice? The, the real difficulty for this employee um, was that the problems appeared to go fairly high up the chain where people to whom she was reporting the incidents were allegedly also engaging in, in inappropriate behaviour. But putting to one side, uh, you know, that kind of what was described as that toxic environment, if you've got robust systems of reporting and everything else in place, the most critical thing is these things need to be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. Now, be it, you know, the, the focus this afternoon is on bullying incidents, uh, but um, harassment, all of those kind of matters, it's important to take them seriously. If, as an employer, allegations are put to you, it's important to think about suspension of employees that have been alleged to have done things, to act swiftly, uh, to uh, give the other party or parties the opportunity to be heard about those things. So there's two sides to every story. Not every case um, are allegations going to be made out. Sometimes there isn't enough evidence. Obviously in this case it's quite an extreme example and that's part of the reason why we deal with it uh, this afternoon and also in the bullying ebook that we'll be talking about a bit later. But uh, it, it's, it, it's a case in point in terms of while at the extreme end of where uh, had earlier action been taken to investigate these things, um, arguably it wouldn't have escalated to where it was. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you're right, the amount, I mean, the amount of um, damages there are quite high at $1.3 million, but you know, it's also the severe impact it would have had on the employee um, that, that happened and we you know, want to eradicate that. So. That's right. Okay, well, um, yeah, do you want to take us on to, to the next case? Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, this one is, is Wern and, and State of Victoria. It's also a, a Victorian decision. This one's very recent. It's from the 8th of February uh, 2017. Uh, this case in, also involved a significant uh, damages order. Uh, in this case, it was more than $600,000. Uh, there was a state government employee. Uh, uh, she was... Um, the employee uh, had known mental health issues. Uh, the employer was aware of those things. She suffered a breakdown, it was described at, uh, after, the, after her managers failed to properly consider her condition uh, when she had a mounting conflict uh, with a supervisor. Uh, the case manager in question has now uh, not worked for more than eight years. Mm -hmm. uh, the breakdown allegedly occurred in November of 2008. Bear in mind this decision didn't come through until last month, so February 2017, uh, and that was in the course of her employment. The claim that the employee brought was that she was exposed to bullying and harassment, and that exacerbated her pre-existing condition, uh, which was chronic adjustment disorder, and there was also a diagnosis of mild anxiety and depression. The case manager in this case argued that a supervisor bullied and harassed her, uh, provided excessive and unreasonable criticism, there was micromanagement of her performance, inconsistent directions. These are all quite common things that form part of bullying complaints and they might seem very bread and butter and we'll talk in a little bit about what is and isn't workplace bullying because there are many things that aren't workplace bullying but oftentimes if you're subject to them uh, you might consider them to be bullying but uh, don't actually meet the, the statutory definition of bullying under the Fair Work uh, Act. Um, part of the employee's claims here was that her manager also held unrealistic expectations uh, and gave her feedback that was uh, intended to humiliate her or embarrass her. So I understand this, we actually end up with quite a clear definition around what bullying is from what the judge said. So that's, that's right, yeah. The, the statutory definition uh, under the Fair Work Act at least, which wasn't primarily what this was looking at, is where um, an individual or a group of workers uh, repeatedly, so repeated is a key thing, one-off incidents wouldn't constitute bullying in the Fair Work Act context, um, towards a worker or a group of workers at work, 
and, and the second component of that is that that creates a risk to health and safety. Mm -hmm. Now the exception to that is reasonable management action that's also conducted in a reasonable way. So it might be reasonable to performance manage somebody, and it is reasonable, but you might go about that in an unreasonable fashion. So you might, for example, moving away from this case but just for the moment, say to somebody, um, uh, this work is crap, you might be quite a, uh, you know, a direct manager in that sense, you don't mince your words, mm -hmm. or you might say, well, you, you're a bit crap at this, aren't you? Quite different in context of it. So that it's a reasonable action that you've taken, but you haven't conducted it in a reasonable way. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's where the boundaries often lie. Now that might be a one-off incident, which wouldn't meet the statutory definition of bullying, but as we'll see in this case, bullying can also give rise to other types of claims. Okay. So uh, the, the supervisor in this case um, was also alleged by the employee to have isolated this employee socially from her colleagues. Uh, including an incident um, where uh, her supervisor told everyone in her team uh, except her that she was a grandmother. Um, again, you might think, well, you know, I don't ask, necessarily ask this person if they want a coffee when I go on a coffee run, because a few times they've said no, mm -hmm. am I bullying them? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but this is quite a bit more, more serious in terms of the allegations. Now, the judge in this case acknowledged uh, that the supervisor provided feedback in a manner that may have em em embarrassed or humiliated her and that contributed to her anxiety and stress, but it wasn't unreasonable behaviour. So it actually fell short of bullying. But, so the bullying claims were rejected. Now, what did the judge find? Um, the judge said that the incidents here were manifestations of interpersonal conflict between the supervisor and the case manager. They weren't instances of bullying. So. For example, the supervisor's failure to tell the case manager that she was a grandmother was innocuous. Um, the case manager interpreted it as a snub and that caused her distress, uh, but that was an unreasonable behaviour. But it still may have had a bearing, and in fact did have a bearing uh, on this person's mental health. So what did that mean? The Victorian Supreme Court found that the employer, which was the State Department of Human Services, breached its broader duty of care towards the employee and ex exacerbated that person's psychological injuries by failing to exercise the standard of care reasonably expected of an employer. Okay. Uh, the, the breakdown that the case manager had came, came by escalating tension with her supervisor, what the judge referred to as her, her overly rigid management style, uh, pulling the employee up on minor grammatical errors, etc., and basically said, look, it's the cumulative effect of stress and anxiety on this person. And the court criticised the employer in this case for their failure to formally recognise what was a deteriorating relationship uh, between the case manager and a supervisor uh, and to develop and implement policies, we'll come back to that later, to handle bullying complaints and interpersonal conflict. Uh, and, they, and the judge said, look, the HR team should have stepped in, should have helped resolve this interpersonal conflict, uh, but then, rather than that, their attitude was, your professionals sort it out amongst yourselves. Now, in a white collar context, that's not uncommon. People say, look, suck it up, mm, deal with it, yep. you know. If you don't like each other, just sort it out, or leave, or whatever else is the case. And look, sometimes that may be appropriate, but in this case, while it didn't constitute bullying, it still amounted to a breach of duty of care, the employer otherwise had, mm -hmm. and had, with, with very unfortunate ramifications for the individual. Mm -hmm. Mm. I might just jump in there with regard to what we offer under the apprenticeship services space. Um, we are very much required now to offer a mentoring service for apprentices that may be going through similar um, areas where they, they are, might have a deteriorating relationship. So uh, just as a bit of a reminder for employers that are working with Apprenticeship Support Australia that we do have that facility for our mentors to get involved with your apprentices and with your employees to help sort of break that down. If you feel like you've got a deteriorating relationship, then we're definitely here to get in, engaged with you and help you in that space as well. So I'm assuming that the, the law that's come out here um, would apply to apprentices as well? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think a service like that would have certainly assisted mm -hmm. uh, in, in, a, in a similar case in an apprenticeship context. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So if you were to kind of boil that down to a few key things that employers should be doing in just based on that case, what would you, what would you say? I would say be aware that certain circumstances may not be bullying but may be other things, may be breach of duty of care or perhaps creating an unsafe work environment under work health and safety legislation. 
Um, on the face of it, looking at the subject matter of this case, it does look somewhat innocuous. So there's a little bit of a disconnect, if you like, between what the allegations were, you know, not telling someone you're a grandmother, and but it's the unfortunate effect that it had, and perhaps a, a bit of an oversight, significant oversight by HR, not to have stepped in and basically left them up to their own devices, that led that led to that situation. So I'd say if there was a key takeaway, it's don't fixate on a statutory definition of bullying or only look at one side of it. Certain conduct, and you shouldn't shy away from full and frank performance management, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, you can even accept that there is a spectrum of different kinds of management style. Not everybody has to, you know, conduct themselves in a softly, softly way necessarily. Sometimes being direct can be helpful. Mm -hmm. You know, oftentimes another complaint that might come from employees is that their employer is passive aggressive. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Sometimes being direct is helpful. The question is, be mindful of what is and isn't bullying, but also be mindful of your broader statutory obligations towards your employees in terms of duty of care and, and safe work environment. And it does seem that that was a little bit cumulative as well. Yes. It kept going for a period Absolutely. of time. So, uh, yeah. Okay, well, do you want to take us on to your final case uh, sure. for today? And, um, yeah. This is. Uh, the I, might, I might just remind people that if they have got questions, get them in on the comments section there, just so that we can be addressing them on the way through. So thank you. No worries. Um, so Tor is and Commissioner of Police uh, is a New South Wales Industrial Relations Commission decision. Again, quite recent, 20th of January 2017. Now this case involved a, a senior special uh, constable. Uh, who uh, the allegations that the Commission dealt with in this case uh, were that uh, that person had engaged in what was described as extremely serious workplace misconduct. Um, there was boasting in the workplace about alleged uh, sexual conquests um, uh, and discussion of piercings in sensitive spaces, etc. It was all, all quite inappropriate. Uh, the New South Wales IRC in this case found that the constable uh, who worked in security at government facilities including um, State Parliament House just down the road um, displayed what was described as a complete disregard uh, for the sensitivities of his colleagues including young female police officers who were uh, among some of the people who uh, were the targets of that, uh, of that behaviour that the Commission determined. Um, this employee in question had quite a long and, and, uh, and distinguished period of service. Uh, there was a commendation for bravery amongst that, um, but he was dismissed in, in January of 2016, uh, where there were these allegations that he had breached uh, the New South Wales Police Force's uh, harassment, discrimination and bullying policy and guidelines. Mm -hmm. uh, when he'd asked a young female officer um, invitations towards unwelcome sexual con um, conduct. Uh, there was an attempt also made to intimidate some colleagues into not complaining about uh, the behaviour that he was engaging in. The police commissioner argued that this employee's conduct amounted to what was described as serious systemic sexual harassment, um, which was unlawful and contrary to the workplace policies uh, of the New South Wales uh, Police. Uh, it was said that that was conduct in which uh, this senior special constable deliberately engaged uh, and that he was given repeated warnings that his behaviour was inconsistent with the seniority that his role held, uh, the fact that it had a supervisory function uh, and the responsibility on him uh, to be a role model uh, to, to more junior staff. Uh, so, in other words, he was continuing to engage in a pattern of inappropriate lewd conduct um, that created an environment in which um, this person's colleagues, particularly his junior colleagues, um, did not feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. The employee, in this case the constable, denied most of the allegations, not all of them. Um, he simply explained his behaviour way as being innocent joking. Uh, the uh, commissioner, Commissioner Murphy, criticised the constable for the lack of the credibility of his evidence, um, for the failure that, his failure to accept responsibility particularly for the more salacious allegations made against him uh, and um, the fact that he blamed the culture of the workplace um, and also the employee's failure to train him in its policies associated with workplace conduct. Commissioner Murphy's conclusion in the case was that uh, the constable's behaviour was well over the line, that's a direct quote, um, and into the territory of what would be considered unacceptable conduct uh, and that it was sexual harassment. Um, there was also a finding that the commissioner had behaved unprofessionally 
Uh, the comments were inappropriate and offensive and that constituted harassment and bullying uh, of his colleagues. Uh, the Commission also rejected the Constable's claims that this was a, a cultural uh, matter, mm -hmm. uh, it, and I'll quote directly, a fair assessment of that evidence compels the conclusion that the conduct of the Constable went way beyond what would possibly be captured by the Constable's claim that everybody at work is doing a joke and things like that. So uh, he also rejected the, the Constable's claims that he never received harassment, discrimination, bullying or code of conduct training. Another quote from the Commissioner, I reject entirely the proposition that training or lack thereof can in any way uh, exculpate the, con the constable with respect to those aspects of his conduct upon which the, uh, uh, the police relies as a justification for the decision to dismiss him. Um, the Commissioner, this is important, said that uh, someone occupying such a senior position didn't need to undergo training to, un to, un to arrive at the realisation that it's completely unacceptable to, do, to make uh, the comments uh, that were dealt with in the course of this decision. Um, there was also a rejection uh, of, the, of the employee's claims that he never received warnings about uh, his inappropriate sexual comments and behaviour in the workplace. So all of this in the context of how the hearing would have played out would have been that uh, here are our policies, here's what we've trained on, mm -hmm. coupled with a submission to say, by the way, we don't really need to go this far. We, we take a belt and braces approach and we make sure people understand that. And that's really important. And that's where policies that you'll pick up in HR Advance, for example, would, would assist. Mm -hmm. Not a complete solution, but certainly takes you a good way towards um, things that you can adapt to be suitable for your workplace. But um, in this case, it was said, well, there is a degree of common sense here. You, the, the, the nature of the comments that you that we dealt with in the course of the hearing were completely inappropriate, and that should have been obvious to you. Uh, and um, the, the the finding of this said that um, that should not that kind of behaviour shouldn't be tolerated and can't be excused. Uh, and as such, the seriousness of the misconduct meant that there was no unfair dismissal in this case. Uh, that, and that's how that's how it was dealt with. Okay. So, I mean, is it safe for employers to expect then that courts and tribunals will always accept that inappropriate conduct will be grounds for dismissal um, on the basis of harassment and bullying? Or, you know, I, I take it from what you say, training and policies are still very important there. So, Absolutely. Yeah. While it's comforting perhaps to know that, you know, you don't, you don't have to train necessarily people to the nth degree on, you know, I shouldn't have to tell you that talking about piercings is not in, mm. in, in those kind of places is not appropriate in the workplace. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the policies and training would still have helped immeasurably the position of the employer in terms of defending this case. Because no doubt, if there were no policies or inadequate policies, there would have been criticism. Mm -hmm. And there would have been some degree of criticism to say, while it went beyond what was there, there would also have been, I would have thought, some adverse comments made about the employer in any event, particularly in relation to the lower level incidents that might form part of the bullying and harassment allegations. So, no, never proceed under the presumption that um, people will exercise common sense, because in many cases they don't. Uh, and um, you, you need to, without creating a lowest common denominator approach, have sensible and forcible policies in place that clearly set out uh, at least some examples of what would constitute acceptable and unacceptable. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if, if employers are watching this and wondering about their policies at the moment, then HR, HR Advance would be a good place for them to go and start to have a look at that um, from that perspective. Absolutely. Um, yes. Thank, Thank you, Sarah. That's, that's given us a really good um, snapshot of the current law and, and where we're up to in terms of um, some of the key areas that, that we'll be facing employers. We've got a couple of questions that have come through from, from the audience this afternoon. So one of them is, um, how do I manage jokes between staff that some people see as bullying? Really good question. It is. Uh, and look, it's a perennial issue. You know, different, different cultures have different... Different workplaces have very different cultures. Some, you know, don't joke at all. Some joke quite a bit. Um, and it's important to, again, you, you don't want a fun police approach of, you know, we don't joke around, but it is a question of looking at it and say, would a reasonable person hearing a joke that we're about to make be offended by it? Or, and, and that's not, that's not a, uh, you know, would I consider it to be offensive or not? Would an objective person, uh, you know, sitting on a bus, on a double-decker bus, you know, the, the, the old Clapham omnibus, 
um, interpret this as being offensive in, in some way or another. So if it's in a small group of people and it's something you wouldn't necessarily repeat uh, in, a, in a larger room, perhaps it doesn't pass that test. Okay. Uh, so I would say don't take a fun police approach, take a common sense approach, but err on the side of caution in relation to managing those sorts of things. So if there are certain, if, if you're making jokes that no reasonable person would be offended by, then I don't think that that would pass the threshold of bullying. Mm -hmm. At all. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. Another question that's come through is my employee is, is not performing. How do I tell them without bullying them? Mm -hmm. um, what crosses the line? Yeah, another really difficult question. Um, bullying allegations most commonly arise in this in this performance management context. Mm -hmm. Both bullying allegations and and uh, workers' compensation kind of situations. Um, often linked together. The allegation is, well, my manager is bullying me. They're, um, you know, holding unreasonable standards, or they're giving me warnings, and that's bullying me. Or, uh, and and sometimes that may be bullying. It goes back to what I was saying earlier. Is it is it reasonable to to require people to do their jobs? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. um, you're running a business. You're not running a charity. If people are uh, you know not turning up on time, if they're not doing what they're asked to do within reason, then um, you know that's that's perfectly fine. But are you doing that in a reasonable way? Are you playing the person, not the ball? Are you uh, not setting out clear objectives? Are you being overly passive aggressive, for example? So yes, you can. Um, you can. There are ways and means of managing underperforming employees, and uh, firms like ours can assist in that respect. Uh, HR Advance can assist. Your services, for example, in the apprenticeship context, can assist certainly. Uh, in those situations, and you get the balance right between, you know, effectively performance managing people, and you see where that line is, where you think, well, you might need to pull a particular manager into line, uh, and and say, look, you know, appreciate what you're doing, but perhaps do it this way instead of doing it this way. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the delivery sometimes. That's right. So. Yeah. Another good question that's come in is, um, how do I manage um, a hazing initiation culture with new or young employees? So. Um, there have been some dreadful cases, unfortunately, uh, that um, have dealt with situations like that. Thankfully, things are moving away to some extent, by no means entirely, from that, that initiation issue. The only thing I'd say is, going back to what I was saying earlier, if it's anything that you wouldn't want to see pasted on the front page of, of the newspaper, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be doing it. Mm. Um, I would be, I would be cracking down on it. It's one thing to, you know, to joke around or to um, take the Mickey out of someone in a in a well-meaning way, mm -hmm. and it's not up to you to decide. It's up to the reasonable person to decide. It's another thing entirely to, you know, have them go through some sort of initiation because the power imbalance between you as the employer and someone who might be an apprentice, who mm -hmm. might be quite young, mm -hmm. um, inexperienced in the workplace, is simply too significant to simply pass and say, oh, it's all in good fun, it's too dangerous, and mm -hmm. I wouldn't would advocate um, that, kind of, that kind of initiation okay. ceremony. Okay, thank you. Um, we've, we've, we've run out of time, time so that was our last question that we've got time for, but I would encourage the audience, if you do have further um, questions, then to record them in, in the comments section, we'll definitely get back to you on that. Also be aware that there will be an e-book available, giving um, more information on the areas that you've covered today um, seen us, so please uh, register to, uh, to download for that um, that ebook. Um, also, be aware that you know we we do have lots of services that we offer that can support in this space. If we've spoken about something today you've got particular interest in and would like more information, especially around HR advance or in the apprenticeship area, where we can provide support to apprentices on the ground. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us, inbox us, or send us a comment, and we'll definitely pick up on all those and come back to you. Um, we're pretty excited to have run um, ASA TV Facebook Live this afternoon, so thanks for coming along and joining us. Uh, we look forward to other sessions like this in the future. Thanks very much to Sina for sharing your time and, um, and for your valuable information. So um, thank you very much and have a good afternoon.